Good evening, this is Dr. Lewis Foley, one of the exam prep faculty. I want to welcome you to the oral board prep webinar for Tuesday, September 21st, 2021. Tonight's going to be one of our caseless defense type of webinars, and we are going to go ahead and get started. First, I want to start by going through the GoToWebinar control panel, which I suspect most of you have seen before. A little orange box with a white arrow allows you to collapse or expand the control panel so that you can get it out of your view during the webinar. The upper portion of the control panel is very important because this will determine how you participate from an audio standpoint during the webinar. And by default, the software will usually choose the microphone and speakers on your computer. However, if you prefer to use a telephone, and particularly if you're in an area with a lot of background noise, it may be advantageous to use a telephone. And you can do this by clicking audio setup, picking use telephone. You'll be given numbers to dial in, an access code, and an audio PIN number. The audio PIN number is very important. If you don't complete this last step, I cannot unmute you to let you participate in the hot seat. The bottom portion of the control panel, we do not use. So please don't type any questions in there because I will not know that you have done so. Uh, by the way, this, this presentation is a little bit of an older appearance of the control panel, but the controls are essentially the same. So again, we don't use the typing and questions part. We use the raise a hand feature. This is how you would volunteer to be in the hot seat, or if you have a question, how you would let me know that you have a question. I do want to mention that all of our webinar sessions are recorded. So if you need to get access to a recorded webinar session, contact our exam pro staff and they can help you with that. So we are going to be talking tonight about caseless defense practice, and I'm going to cut to the chase. We're going to get right to it. Uh, this is going to be the time to click the raise a hand feature if you want to volunteer, and we will uh, bring up the case list. So let me just get the case list in position so that we can uh, take a look at those. And that is not it. Here we go. Perfect. All right. So give me one second and I will get the first person into the hot seat. Dr. St. Germain, can I go to you first? Yes, that's fine. All right. Do you have a preference which list? Let me see, do I have your list? Hopefully I do. Uh, you should, and I don't have a preference, whichever you prefer. Is it under just Germain? That I think how so. How the list would be? Probably. Okay, all right. All right, I'll tell you what, why don't we start, we'll just start with GYN and go from there. Just one second, I apologize for the wait. No problem. Let's talk about case number 39. Okay. So uh, this patient got serial screening and it looks like the interval was shortened because of her high risk HPV results. Um, but her psychology was always normal? Correct. Okay, so uh, once you had these persistently 
positive HPV results, what, what were your concerns and what were the options for how to manage this problem? Yes, so this patient came to me in 2019, so she'd had obviously the previously persistent um, positive high-risk HPVs, and it was high-risk other, so not 16 or 18, and with the colposcopies with benign biopsies. So when I had seen her and counseled her, we discussed that she could continue potentially on the algorithm where she could get a pap smear um, every year, with then potentially needing a colposcopy with biopsy, or because she'd had such persistently positive testing, she could have a more definitive treatment with a leap to try to remove um, that tissue that was causing the persistently positive testing. So we discussed the options of either continuing more conservative management, although frustrating for the patients to have frequent biopsies in the office, or to have a more definitive but more aggressive treatment with a leap. Uh, and she had elected to have a leap at that time. Okay, I have a couple of questions for you. My first question is, you mentioned HPV positive other, meaning not 16 or 18. Why is that relevant? Well, we know that 16 and 18 are particularly virulent, so any of those three being positive in a screen, it would still change her, her where she falls on the algorithm in terms of does she need a colposcopy or can we um, observe for a year or three years or whatever. Um, but if she'd had 16 and 18, I would have been more concerned that maybe the colposcopies were not getting an accurate tissue sample. Um, even with the persistently positive other high-risk HPV, it's concerning to have so many benign colposcopies and a persistently... Okay. okay, so 16 and 18 would have been more concerning. And this would be for what reason? Why are they more concerning? They have a higher risk of progression to cervical cancer. Okay. Are there any differences between 16 and 18 in regards to the, the um, prognosis or, or what that potentially indicates? They function slightly differently in how they're affecting the cervical tissue, but they both are have the potential to lead to cervical cancer, although I believe 16 is more likely to have a squamous abnormality and 18 can have more um, adenocarcinoma abnormalities. Okay, now there was something else you said. You said that you gave the patient the option of an excisional procedure to remove the tissue which was causing these abnormal results. Now my question is how do you know what tissue to remove if your colposcopies and biopsies have been unrevealing. Correct. The, um, in a lead procedure, I use um, Lugol solution. So if there was something that came up abnormal, like a non-staining, um, of course, I would plan on removing that tissue. Um, but I, the concern with the persistently positive is that potentially in that in the cervical tissue closest um, like the ect ectocervix, that there's abnormal abnormalities that are not being picked up on the colposcopy. So I would just do a, an excision with a, I typically use a cone leap device to see if. You I mentioned, it, you mentioned, you mentioned non-staining of Lugol's mm -hmm. and you mentioned the ectocervix. Describe for me, uh, ideally, what, what part of the cervix are you hoping to remove with your excision? In terms of Lugol's, I hope to remove any non-Lugol staining, uh, and it tends to be closer to where the endocervical canal, endocervical canal is, so it, it usually contains a portion of ectocervix and endocervical glands. Okay, so that's what I might think of as the, the transition zone. Have you Correct. used that terminology before? Okay, all right, or transformation zone, depending on how you want to call it. Okay. Um, and and that's that's important, right? That's that's your goal, right? Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that this can be uh, sometimes in near the canal, particularly in older patients. Mm -hmm. uh, my question about this patient is, why did you choose to do a leap rather than a cone? Either are technically options. The the cone can have more morbidity with higher bleeding risk. Um, and she's had several 
colposcopies before, so she doesn't have a lot of cervical tissue um, left. So there's some concern, am I getting, could I be getting too far into the lower segment or something like that? Um, so I tend to use a leap unless they have like a CIN3 or abnormality. Did you tell me that she's had several colposcopies, so she doesn't have a lot of cervix left? Is that what I heard you say? I, that's a possibility. So in people, not necessarily this patient, but like people who have had excisional procedures before, not necessarily colposcopies, but previous leaps, that um, sometimes the cones or the leaps, depending on the size of the device that you're using, can be difficult if their cervix is, for example, flush with the vaginal wall. Okay, if you're going to do a cone, what can you do to reduce the risk of bleeding uh, during the procedure? I usually place stay sutures prior to the excision, and then um, if that isn't enough to control the bleeding, then I can I'll use like a purse string suture um, around the around the cervix afterwards. Okay, where do you place your stay sutures? Uh, usually, approximately at three and nine o'clock. All right. Um, besides the potential risk of complications, uh, what other differences are there besides between a leap and a cone? So the cone is obviously a cold knife, so it doesn't have any kind of cautery. So for the pathologist review, they don't have any of that artifact, which can be nice depending on the pathology. Um, the leap does use cautery, so there is risk that there's some artifact with that and difficult, more difficult to determine exactly what um, the margins are looking like. Um, they both are about the same in terms of operative time, depending on, on the bleeding uh, risk. And then post-operatively, the cold knife can have a little bit more post-operative bleeding just because it's not as cauterized, but in general, the risks are similar. Okay. Now, um, in this particular case, your pathology was benign. Correct. What did you recommend? What did you recommend to the patient? I recommend that you have a repeat Pap smear a year after, which um, has not happened yet. A Pap smear alone? A year following the surgery. Just cytology alone? No cytology with HPV. Okay. What do you call that? Co-testing. Co-testing. Okay, important point for everybody listening in the exam. This is an area where we often, we, we say something, we mean something different than what we said. Pap smear really just refers to cytology. Mm -hmm. HPV testing is just HPV testing. When we put them together, it's a co-test. So for everybody listening, make sure to be very specific about that in the exam. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Any I'm giving you some feedback here, and then if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, I like the discussion very much. I, I think that the the case is very obvious as to what the concerns are. I like the fact that you mentioned um, 16 and 18. Uh, that is certainly part of our triage there. 16, again, more commonly with squamous cell, and 18 more common with adenocarcinoma, as you mentioned. But together, 16 and 18 represent the, uh, the majority of cervical cancers arising from those two types of HPV, about 70%, I think is the number, that are 16 and 18 related. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular case, I think the hard part is that you have nothing from a histologic standpoint right. to guide you. So mm -hmm. this is really not a therapeutic case, but more a diagnostic case. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, a 51 year old where fertility is not an issue, I do think this is a case that um, potentially favors a cold knife cone, but at the very least, uh, you want to get a larger excision rather than a smaller excision. Yeah. Uh, you want to make sure you get the entire transformation zone. And ideally, you'd like to get as much of the canal as you can, too, because one of the concerns is that there could be a lesion up in the canal that you're missing. Um, so the other thing that I want to ask you about LEAP versus CONE that we didn't talk about is LEAP can potentially be done in the office. So this right. can be an issue of convenience and cost as well. Now, I do want to ask you one last question. It just occurred to me while I was um, thinking about this. What is the peak age for cervical cancer? 
postmenopausal? So most cervical cancer occurs in postmenopausal women. That is what I am thinking, but I would have to confirm that. So, you know, we think about most cancers being more common with advancing age, but actually for cervical cancer, it has a, a what they call a bimodal distribution, which means the peak incidence of cervical cancer occurs in the 30s and in the 50s. So it's generally younger patients rather than older patients. So you, you can take a look at that so you don't have to take my word for it, but it's a bimodal distribution, peak in the 30s, peak in the 50s. Okay. Any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? No, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Great job. I'm going to mute you, and then uh, we'll get the next person in the hot seat, and we'll keep going. Give me one second as I go back to my, my sheet here. Dr. Neese, are you there? Yes. Is it okay if I come to you next? That would be great. Oh, um, All right, let me just my list get the case list now. Howard. Say that again? My list is actually under Howard. Okay, great. Thank you for telling me that. Let me... Howard, got it. Thank you. Do you have a pref Do you have a preference which list we look at? I guess since we just did GYN, uh, let's try OB. All right. Is it okay if I ask a quick question about the previous candidate's case? Yeah, yeah, fire away. What's the question? So she had mentioned doing a leap comb, like the fissure leap comb, that essentially, uh, uh, what I had understood of that. Um, is that something that we can say? How does that work into the leap. So process. I definitely think that that sort of goes along with the idea that you want to get a large excision, okay? You want to get an adequate sampling of the entire area because it's a diagnostic procedure for that particular case since we don't have any histology. So I would favor if you're going to do a leap, it would be kind of a leap cone type of deal. You're trying to get the uh, the entire canal and transformation zone. I still think that in a patient where um, it's a diagnostic procedure. I do like the idea, and I think a lot of people favor the idea of a cold knife cone, particularly older physicians where, you know, this idea that there's so much more bleeding with a cone than there is with a leap is a common theme that I hear from younger physicians. But in reality, if you are careful, there are some things that you can do. We, she mentioned stay sutures. You can definitely also uh, infiltrate the cervix with some dilute vasopressin that can sometimes be done or uh, you can um, do uh, post-procedure uh, Moncel's solution, which we usually do after cautery. Uh, there are some different sutures that have been described if you have bleeding from the bed. So bottom line, where I'm going with this, I think the advantage of a cone when it's a diagnostic procedure, um, meaning a patient where we really don't know what's going on, is it gives the pathologist one large specimen with very clear margins for them to be able to look at. So I don't think that uh, Dr. St. Germain did anything wrong. It's just a matter of preference that that case would have been one that I might have preferred to do as a cone. Uh, but the way she described it and talked about it was good. And like you said, I think what she was describing was to do basically a leap version of a cone, getting a nice generous specimen. Does that answer your question? Oh yes, that's perfect. I just haven't seen that much in the practices we've done in the past. Anyone mentioning that device and we use it a lot. So I was very fascinated on your take on that device. Yeah, yeah, I think it's great. And by the way, one of the things I tell people all the time, and I'm going to tell all of you listening tonight, your goal in the exam is not to convince the examiner that you are correct, meaning you don't, you're not trying to convince them that your way is the right way. You're trying to convince them that your approach was a reasonable approach. Because they might, you know, there are different ways to do different things. They might disagree. They might have done it differently. But if they can listen to your thought process, your reasons for what you did, and it makes sense, and it is reasonable, then they are going to be fine with that. They're not going to tell you that. 
Um, but again, so yes, I'm, I'm completely comfortable with what she did and your comments are very appropriate, okay? Awesome, thank you. Let's get to something here, just one second. Okay, let's talk about case number 53. So I assume based on what I'm reading on the case list that this patient was in spontaneous labor. Yes. Okay, and she had a previous vaginal delivery? That is correct. Okay, so at what point did you recognize that the baby was OP? We had recognized it, unfortunately, after we had we had noticed it earlier on in her labor process. So we had tried um, repositioning the peanut ball, high fowlers, a lot of various positionings to help encourage. And even with pushing, we tried manual rotation along with pushing to help correct the persistent OP. She had mentioned previously that her prior baby was born vaginally and occiput posterior as well. But Interesting. Are there any risk factors for for a baby to be OP? Yeah, for her, I believe it is her um, pelvic shape for sure. Okay. What well, can you tell me more about that? So I believe that she had more of an anthropoid pelvis, so favoring more of the occiput posterior position, since the wider diameter is. Um, more posterior, more posterior, the wider part of the baby's head coming down through the birth canal was favoring being in that position. Okay. Now, um, the anthropoid pelvis, you said you had the wider part posteriorly. What can you tell me about the other sort of pelvic, parent pelvic types, if you will? So you have the gynecoid pelvis, which is the most favorable for a vaginal delivery. Um, you have more of the um, platypoid pelvis, which is more of a deep transverse to rest type picture because those babies usually are per persistent OT. Um, and then you have the android pelvis, which is usually more okay. of a, a failure of descent because their pelvis is uh, more narrow. Okay, good. Now, I'm, I'm going to point something out here for everybody listening. Do I think that they're likely to ask you about the the parent pelvic types? Maybe not, but they might ask you about the case like this where the patient's uh, baby was OP. You mentioned the previous baby was OP. Uh, you know, what are some potential risk factors? And I would be thinking about the anthropoid pelvis, so th that sort of type of pelvic architecture for the reasons you uh, mentioned does favor uh, the OP presentation. And if we were talking about a transverse arrest, then we'd be thinking about the dimensions of the pelvis being stretched out more side to side than front to back, which would sort of favor that. So this is a great example of how the, the pelvic types and the, if you will, sort of clinical pelvimetry can come into a discussion. So I like the way you mentioned that. I want to ask you, uh, you mentioned about the manual rotation. So do you do manual rotation? Um. We do, we do not do like a forceps manual rotation. If anything, we do more like hands on, like just trying to encourage just some gentle rotation, but we don't offer any forceps uh, rotation. Okay, but rotation just with the, with the operator's hand. Right, with, with the maternal effort. Is, it, is that dangerous? If you're forceful, any position, like any type of pushing on the baby head could be forceful, just like any downward traction could be forceful and it could be harmful. But I think that's where you have more trained experience um, to decrease the risk to maternal morbidity or fetal outcomes. 
Okay. Now, uh, I want to ask you a couple other questions about this. You mentioned uh, on the case list, arrest of active phase of labor. So tell me about how you would define arrest of active phase of labor. So she was actually um, a second stage arrest. So she got completely dilated and put, she was a multip. So she pushed greater than two hours uh, or sorry, greater than three hours with an epidural. Um, unfortunately, I actually had COVID while I was updating this list and that was something that I had highlighted to change and I didn't have time to, or I thought I had changed it, but in my fever haze, I did not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry to hear about COVID. I'm glad. It sounds like you're doing better. Yes. Okay, but you meant to put a rest of the, of the uh, descent. Is that what you said? Yes. So she got 10, okay. cent 10, 10 centimeters and pushed for three hours and really all we got was more caput. Okay. Now, did she have regional anesthesia or not? She did. Okay. And so your criteria is three hours without a descent with a patient with regional anesthesia who's a multip? Yeah, or two hours if she were natural. What if she didn't have regional anesthesia? Then how much time would you give her? Typically two hours. But you said two hours, two hours. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, you know, for, for a second, I was thinking about the criteria in my mind when you were answering and I was hearing what I wanted to hear, not what I was, what you actually said. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so you had a rest of descent and maternal exhaustion. She had been pushing hard for a long time and you took her to the operating room for a cesarean delivery. What concerns did you have when you were going back for that cesarean delivery related to the labor process that she had endured? Um, definitely was worried about, um, since she had been there in active labor and it had been so long and she'd been pushing so long, acne was at the top of the list and increased risk of bleeding. So before we went to the operating room, we actually had um, all the anti um, hemorrhage medications and our anesthesia always brings in the TXA for these types of cases in case you need it. Um, and then we also make sure they have, when it's not an acute situation, we make sure they have two good working IVs before we go back in case. We also like to um, give them azithromycin, 500 milligrams IV, um, because she was in active labor, her water was broken, so she's also at a higher risk of postpartum infection. Um, and this also can be very difficult to do the delivery. And so these are, um, we have a laborist on staff, so it's always two physicians when it's kind of this deep arrest type of situation. And we have an operator and fetal pillow below to help decrease the pressure on the fetal head um, to help decrease um, risk vaginally as well during the delivery. And then also you worry about extensions because her anatomy is going to be different. So when she has been pushing for so long and she's been complete, her cervix is, you know, fully dilated. So it's flush with the lower uterine segment. So you always make your hysterotomy significantly higher, higher and make sure you know where her bladder and regular anatomy is because it's definitely distorted from that large term fetal head. Nicely done. I like the discussion of a variety of different risks that we would consider to be potentially elevated. Two follow-up questions. You mentioned the azithromycin. Do you give that in addition to your prophylactic antibiotics or you give it as your prophylactic antibiotics? Good question. We actually do um, two grams of ANSYF. I should have mentioned that as her primary prophylaxis, but just because she's in labor, the extra step that we would take is the azithromycin. Okay. And then my second question is, you talked about having an operator available to come from below to help, I believe you were indicating to maybe elevate the head out of the pelvis if necessary? Yes. Are there any other uh, techniques that you can use to accomplish the same thing? Um, we typically use the fetal pillow, which is, um, an inflatable device so that way when you push on the baby's head it's not such direct pressure to elevate the head back up into the pelvis for her um the head wasn't very low so it really wasn't much of an issue um but the fetal pillow has helped significantly with those um, deep heads that we've had that were engaged okay any other any other uh ideas any other suggestions um if she's actively having contractions, obviously we, we would stop um, Pitocin if she was getting that. 
you can give a uterine relaxant um, to help stop the contraction too, if that's helping push the baby's head down. Okay. Anything else? There's probably something obvious I am leaving out, so I apologize. But besides the heroic measures of, you know, um, an atypical delivery, delivering a baby in a cephalic presentation, um, I'm, I can't think of anything else. Wait, Obviously, what did you say at the end? What was it? What was the, you said something about heroic measures? Did like I hear that? Doing some kind of atypical delivery, like delivering a baby breech who's cephalic that's too deep in the pelvis. Besides anything like that, um, the other thing is, you know, obviously when we were prepping her for the operating room, um, we would place um, her Foley catheter as per usual, and that would decrease the bladder, which would make it easier to get to the fetal head. But I feel like there's something obvious I'm forgetting that we probably okay. Make so sure. so. One one thing when when you get in for everybody listening when you get in the exam if you get um, an examiner in there asking you over and over anything else anything else if you reach the point where you can't think of anything else your best bet is to cut the discussion off and say something like that's what I can think of right now now don't be careful not to sell yourself short and start apologizing oh you know I'm sorry I'm probably forgetting something but maybe you are maybe you aren't sometimes they have something in mind sometimes they're just pushing you. But again, if you reach the end of the road, you have nothing else, just go ahead and cut the discussion off. Say, that's what I can think of right now. If, there, if, there, if you can't think of anything, if you get to the point during a line of questioning where you don't know the answer, then of course you're gonna say, I don't know. Um, that is really important because sometimes what happens is when we start kind of rambling or trying to kind of sort of somehow make it better that we can't think of anything else to say, we sometimes volunteer something that's not something we want to talk about um so be careful there okay, okay. now what i will point i will point out one one thing that, yep good and i will point out one thing that's been described and it's just one other option that i can think of uh which is something called a reverse breach extraction basically like the, the idea is maneuver? is it like what is that the padwadian maneuver I don't know of it by that name, but I'll tell you what it is, and you can tell okay. me if that's the same thing that you're talking about. You okay. basically have made your hysterotomy, and the head is down in the pelvis. And the baby does not deliver easily, so you reach into the fundus, and you find the baby's feet, and you basically deliver the baby's feet uh, out of the incision, and then on the lower extremities and the buttocks will follow. So now you have the baby out of the uterus, and you can grasp the baby by the ankles and you can put traction on the ankles to elevate the baby out of the pelvis okay the reason they call it a reverse breech extraction is because it's similar to putting traction on the feet when you deliver a second twin by reaching into the uterus grabbing the ankles and bringing the second twin down out of the vagina which we call a breech extraction for a second twin so they call this a reverse breech extraction I know it's been described in different places, including uh, at one point a few years back, it was described in, I think, OBGYN management. So it's not something uh, unique or unusual. It's, it's been around. Um, but, but if you're not familiar with it, I'm not advocating you have to bring it up. I just wanted to suggest it is another option, something if you've never heard of it, you could certainly look it up before your exam just so you're aware of it. Okay? That's the thing that I was talking about that said besides heroic measures like a breach delivery for an impacted head. That's kind of what I was hinting at, but then I was kind of okay. to go there. I had done that once in residency yes. with a failed forceps. And in Cincinnati, we called it the Padwadian. I don't know if that's true, but a really old man taught me that. So that's what they used to call it. Well, and you know what? If you bring something up in the exam and the examiner says, I'm not familiar with that, then describe it to them. Because okay. maybe, you know, it's a local term or name, or maybe, the, you know, in my case, maybe it's a name I should know that I don't know. But if you can do, I'm, I'm a big fan, if you can describe something to the examiner, then that's going to be more valuable than knowing an eponym, uh, you know, a yeah. name that's assigned to a particular thing. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to mention regarding the definition for arrested descent. The definitions that I use are a little bit longer time than the ones that you were suggesting. I usually think of the numbers two, three, three, four. 
So two hours for a multip without regional anesthesia, three hours for, oh wait, we were talking about a multip. Forgive me, so you, you told me totally right. I was in my mind thinking of uh, this patient as a nullip, but she's a multip. So you were, you were right on. So two, three, three, four, is that the same numbers you use? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Then ignore me. So uh, my apologies, I was thinking of the older one, two, two, three that we often used to use and I was thinking that you were thinking, anyway, you, you did exactly what I would do. This is a multip, regional anesthesia, three hours. So we're good. Awesome. Thank uh, you. Let's see if I had any other feedback. That was the only thing. So do you have any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? No, thank you very much. So these little things right, thank you. on our list, is it okay to just say, you know, I really, um, so what I meant to say was this. Okay, so here's how I would handle it. I think you're talking about the fact that this says arrest of active phase instead of arrest of descent. Mm -hmm. Okay, the way I would handle it, in the exam, you don't need to apologize for it at the beginning. If they don't ask you about this case, don't worry about it, okay? But if okay. they ask you about this case, when they put this case up on the screen, if you can, if you can remember, if you recognize, oh, there's, a, there's an error here, I would just be very matter of fact and say, I'd like to point out before I discuss this case that there's a data entry error. This patient had arrest of descent, not arrest of the active phase, and I'm sorry about that, 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 that this error occurred. And that's it. It's just a data entry error, okay? You reckon, the good news is you recognize it ahead of time, so then you can just make mention of it if they bring up this case, and then you can go from there. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. I'm going to um, go ahead and mute you, and we will get the next person in. Just one second. Dr. Rockett, are you there? <laughs> yes, I am. Can I go to you next? Sounds good. Do I have a list for you? I hope I do. Let's see. Yes, I think. Yep. Okay. Do you have a preference which list we look at? I don't. How about if we do office? Since we've done GYNOB, now we'll do office. Uh, sounds good. Let me find that list. All right, let's talk about case number 28 for a second. So how did this patient get to you? Okay, so patient 28 is a 49-year-old G2P2 presented for abnormal uterine bleeding with a fibroid uterus. She um, had anemia at that time. Okay, so this patient was a hospital follow-up patient. Um, she was referred to me from her uh, hospital admission to be seen outpatient. Okay, uh, her hospital admission was for the seizures. Yes, 
she uh, presented initially for the seizure, she had a workup. There was uh, the finding of the brain and liver lesions on her um, on her ED imaging that she had. I think she had a short inpatient stay at that time. Um, and then she was significantly anemic required. Uh, I believe that she required transfusion um, because her hemoglobin I think was uh, bordering seven. And, uh, and then when she saw me in the office, um, I initiated a workup uh, because she was likely going to need hysterectomy with her 13 centimeter uterus causing um, a significant anemia. I did want to be thorough about her workup and proceeded with an endometrial biopsy as well. And on that endometrial biopsy, she also had the finding of endometrial hyperplasia with atopia. And from there, okay. um, I did. Okay, go ahead. I have a question for you. What was the mm -hmm. source of the brain and liver lesions? When she was referred to you, was there a diagnosis assigned to those lesions or were they uncertain? They were uncertain at that time. So she had a very short hospital stay, maybe a, a day or two, and there was no uh, final diagnosis at the time of discharge. Um, so when she presented to me and I did that endometrial biopsy and there was that finding of endometrial hyperplasia, there was concern that there could have been um, uh, a coinciding or a synchronous uh, cancer diagnosis um, with the finding of the brain and liver lesions. Um, but thus far in her workup, uh, those findings have been determined to be, um, have not been determined to be um, malignant. Okay. Now, um, when you got back the endometrial biopsy result, uh, I noticed that it looks like you treated the patient uh, with magestrol. Is that true? Um, yes. So in order to bridge her over to her GYN oncology um, appointment, I did initiate therapy uh, to help with the, the bleeding that she was experiencing. So it was more for symptomatic treatment than it was an attempt at treating her histologic diagnosis. That's correct. Okay. What would you recommend the, or what would you expect the G1 oncologist to recommend regarding her endometrial hyperplasia with atypia? I would expect a hysterectomy to be recommended. Um, yeah, so just a, a hysterectomy, and likely at the time of hysterectomy, a frozen, sec frozen section would, would be done, um, and there would be the determination of any um, need for further staging uh, surgery at that time. Okay, uh, so regarding the endometrial hyperplasia with atypia, how likely would you estimate it to be that the hysterectomy might result in a diagnosis of endometrial cancer. Uh, with a tipia, uh, uh, about a 40%, oh, sorry, um, about a 25% uh, uh, likelihood of uh, synchronous uh, endometrial cancer at that time. Okay, now you say endometrial hyperplasia with atypia. Can you describe for me the other classifications within that uh, terminology and the relative risk of an undiagnosed endometrial cancer for each of those? So there's um, within the old terminology or the current terminology, is well, which terminology are you trying to use here? Is this the old terminology or is this the newer terminology? This is the older terminology that was reported on the yeah, pathology so, report. So, so why don't you tell me about the older terminology first? So uh, there is simple hyperplasia. Um, there is 
um, simple hyperplasia with and without atypia, and then there is a complex hyperplasia with and without atypia. And the likelihood okay. of... You were sorry, keep going. About, you were also asking about the likelihood of um, a coexisting cancer with each of those diagnoses, um, about yes. one percent with a simple hyperplasia without uh, atypia, yeah. about five percent with a simple hyperplasia with atypia, and about ten percent with a complex hyperplasia without atypia, and about twenty-five percent with um, complex hyperplasia with atypia. Now, I'll tell you, my recollection was that simple hyperplasia with atypia would be greater risk than complex hyperplasia without. So I had those other two numbers, the 5 and 10, reversed, but I'm going to have to double check it because I don't use okay. that terminology anymore. I use the EIN, but yeah. that's good. You're in, you're in the ballpark. That's good. So the, the issue, certainly complex hyperplasia with atypia would be the most concerning, and that's going to be that 25 or more percent risk. And the numbers do fall in that 25 to 40 percent. You mentioned 40 percent at the beginning of the discussion. So anywhere in that range, I would consider a reasonable number to cite. Um, now, you also acknowledge that there is this newer system, the EIN system. Why is that terminology preferred over this older set of terms? So in terms of diagnosis, um, by pathologists, I believe that the way that that diagnosis is established is more reproducible between um, observers as far as pathologists go. Um, and the treatment, um, therefore, would be uh, more streamlined based on the findings um, reported by the pathologist. Okay, tell me more about the treatment part of it. You're not sure what I'm asking. I'm okay, not. I'm not sure if I asked the I'm not sure if I asked the question in the right way. But here, I think that the last thing you said about the treatment uh, is the important part for clinically for EIN. It uh -huh. streamlines the communication between the pathologist and the clinician regarding what the diagnosis is and what should be done about it. So instead of having this simple versus complex, with or without atypia, which can sometimes be a little confusing, and sometimes management decisions are a little bit more difficult because people are trying to decide what the, you know, the risk is associated with it, the EIN system really divides this into three diagnoses, benign hyperplasia, which is not considered precancer, which is managed usually medically, precancerous condition, which is EIN, which is usually managed surgically. It is definitely a precancer and something, you know, has got to be done about it, usually surgical management, occasionally medical management in certain unique situations. And the third diagnosis is adenocarcinoma, which is obvious what to do with that. So, that's really the advantage of these uh, newer terms is that the diagnosis correlates a little bit more closely with the management, makes it a little bit smoother and easier. And I think that's what you were getting at at the end. Um, so I think that's a really important point if they ask you about that. Now, um, uh, just a couple other very simple questions. So if this patient did have an endometrial cancer, what type of endometrial cancer would you expect it to be? Um, I would expect it to be a, a type 1 um, endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Okay, what percent of all endometrial cancers diagnosed are type 1? I'm going to venture to say about 80%. Okay, and what percent of all patients who die from endometrial cancer have a type 1 endometrial cancer? About, so I'm, I will say that I'm not certain, but I, 
I would venture say to say that it's uh, less than the uh, proportion that it represents overall. So I would guess about 50% um, um, of the deaths attributable to endometrial cancer are type one. Okay, good. Now, what you just said, and there's different ways you can say it, but it's it's perfect. What you were alluding to is that the risk, the prognosis for a type 2 endometrial cancer is worse than the prognosis for a type 1. Am I correct? That's what you yes. were alluding to? Yeah, yeah, I like it. So just to put some numbers on this from a, a source you can double check, um, ACOG's practice bullets on this, I think if you look at it, you'll see that they say, 75% of endometrial cancers are type 1, approximately 25% are type 2. And if you look at the percentage of deaths due to endometrial cancer, about 60% of the deaths are type 1, and about 40% of the deaths are type 2. So very, very close to the numbers that you gave me. So your answers are perfect. I'm totally fine with it. Now, this is something people sometimes ask. Like, if my numbers are close but not exact, is that are they going to give me credit for that? Yeah, absolutely, because the key concepts you definitely understand. And so, you know, the numbers is being in the ballpark is what matters. And people, I know they worry about this, but your numbers were very close to what uh, the practice bulletin cites. More importantly, the concept was very clear. And so I like it. Um, I'm gonna stop here. Did, did this patient, had the evaluation concluded? Did they figure out what the brain and liver lesions were? Um, not to my knowledge, this patient was underinsured, and so when she was referred to the Guyan Anc, um, she was then transferred to an outside facility where she could get uh, her care managed um, at a lesser cost to her. Um, so I, I really have not been able to follow up with her um, and follow up with her chart because she's at an outside facility now. Okay, the one piece of advice I'll give you so this is an unusual case, um, being that it's on the office list, it's more of kind of a GYN topic, okay? Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if this will happen, but I want you to be prepared for it. I, I could imagine in a case like this, since there is kind of this implied possibility of um, metastatic lesions, even though it's not likely, that they mm -hmm. could ask you about the staging of endometrial cancer. Okay, mm -hmm. I think it would be more likely if this was a DNC on your GYN list than it is going to be in the office list. Okay, but just mm -hmm. in case if they do ask you, I would definitely have just like the brief overview of the staging of endometrial cancer uh, in your mind. Okay, okay, all right, good. Any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? No, thank you for your questions. Yeah, thank you. All right, we are going to keep moving. And let me just get the next person into the hot seat here. Sorry, I'm working with the control panel, I'm just trying to get it to do what I want it to do. Okay, now I can see the names. All right, Dr. Benda, do you have a question? No, I was just volunteering to go. All right, I'm gonna get you in the hot seat here. Let me Okay. Pull up your list. Do you have a preference which list we look at? Yes. Can we do gynecology? Absolutely. Let me just pull it up here. A particular case or just any case I want uh, to do? Case five in particular. Okay. Let me look at it here. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, first question, how do you explain the pathology? 
Yes, that is a very, uh, that is my main concern. So I believe that there are a few options. Um, either this okay, patient had a discrete focus of CIN2 with endocervical gland involvement that was conveniently resected during her colposcopy. Um, there was also a a good amount of time between her colposcopy and the actual um, cold knife cone because of COVID, her case had to be um, delayed. So perhaps um, that colposcopy um, and the inflammation reaction allowed some healing as well. Um, another are you telling, option, are you telling me that, are you, wait, wait, are you telling me that CIN2 can spontaneously regress? I mean, you would be correct to say that, you know, when we're, to rephrase it, CIN1 is more more associated with spontaneous regression. That is why we um, recommend an excisional procedure when we go to CIN23. So. Um, okay, but, but answer my question, can CIN2 spontaneously regress? Yes, but it is less likely. Okay, so you were really talking about the inflammation from the, from the biopsy possibly stimulating an immune response that helped resolve the dysplasia, right? Yes, perhaps. And that, that would be true. I mean, I kind of think of like a patient that has a vaginal delivery. Sometimes right. the trauma from delivery will lead to uh, uh, remodeling and resolution of a dysplasia. But also CIN2 can regress on its own, it's just that the likelihood of regression is lower. The number that sticks in my mind is maybe 40% of CIN2 lesions will regress on their own. I, I, okay. I can't remember for certain if that's the number, but that's the number that sticks in my mind. Um, okay. So it is potentially possible that it could spontaneously regress or that the, the biopsy could have stimulated some uh, response that helped it to regress. Okay, what else? Any other possibilities? Yes, I, I would say lastly and most concerning is that somehow um, the original lesion was missed and the cone specimen does not contain the original area of concern. Okay, I would agree with you. That's a possibility. That's probably the one that we're most concerned about, right? Yes. Are there any other possibilities? Not that I can think of. Okay, tell me when you got oh, the oh, pathology. Hold on. So, okay. I mean, possibly this patient had more of a vaginal lesion than a cervical lesion, although that would be, you know, it's I, I would find it unusual to get CIN2 on a colposcopy and not a vaginoscopy. Yes. Now, the point you bring up, if the colposcopy had been non-diagnostic, uh -huh. then potentially I think that 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 would be something to think about is that maybe the patient has something going on in the vagina. I agree with you. Um, what was, what did you do when you got the pathology report? What was the first thing that you did? You still have the pathology report. There's no evidence of dysplasia. What'd you do? I called the pathologist. Why? Because I wanted to know what happened. <laughs> okay. So this, this is great. I love it. This is what I would do if I if I'm I mean I'm expecting something in this case and I did a cone yes. so yes. you know if I don't get anything back I'm going to call the pathologist because one of the possibilities that I think is worth mentioning in the exam is that there could be some inaccuracy in the um, manage or reading of the specimen so for instance maybe the initial specimen was overread or sure. maybe on the cone specimen they didn't really get um, an adequate sampling. Usually they would, but certainly when you call their attention to the concern, they might go back and look and actually say, oh no, you know what? We found an area that does correlate with the pre-op biopsy. Or possibly, although this is much less likely, the specimen itself was mislabeled and that it's not this patient. That's always possible, but that's unlikely. Oh, true. Yes. So okay. more, but more, more importantly, so some type of pathology or handling either discrepancy or error and I kind of lumping that all together. And that's why the first thing I'd always do is call the pathologist. And okay. that they'll usually do is they'll pull both specimens and they'll just double check and maybe get a second opinion. Oftentimes in these cases, they've already done a second opinion uh, sure. in the pathology lab. But, but yeah, so I think that's great. Okay, good. So uh, very nice discussion here. This is an excellent case to have on your list. Let's finish up with this question, which is very important. 
what did you recommend to this patient going forward? So for this patient, I discussed those um, those possibilities that we had just mentioned, and um, she was for a repeat uh, co-testing in six months with the understanding that we would have a low um, threshold for colposcopy with her. Okay, so co-testing in six months. So treating it sort of like you might treat a positive margin. Yes, yes. Okay, good. And I think that's the that's the way to handle a case like this because there is some data to suggest that patients who have a non-diagnostic non-diagnostic excisional procedure when they had a biopsy proven dysplasia preoperatively are at higher risk for residual or recurrent dysplasia. So they should probably be managed like a positive margin rather than like a negative margin with dysplasia in the specimen. Does that make sense, okay. what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Good. That, and that is an important point because at the end of this case, with all the other great discussion that we had, if I asked what you're going to recommend next and you said, oh, I told the patient not to worry that everything's clean, um, just to follow up for, you know, routine follow-up, that would certainly be inappropriate because there is more risk than yeah. would, that would that would not justify it. Um, anyway, I think I, I'm not doing good with my, my words here, but you get the point, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. I do wanna make a couple of points. Um, on paper, you mention in the pathology column an ECC, but in the treatment column, you don't mention the ECC. But I assume what you're telling me is that you did the cone and after the excision, you did an ECC of the remaining canal. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, that is important, and I'm glad you did it. It's not a big, don't worry. I just wanted to okay. clarify, that's what this looks like, and as long as that's what yes. you did, then that's not a problem at all. That's okay. another important point, obviously, because since we didn't find anything in the cone specimen, we really want to know what the status of the residual canal is. Yes. Um, I'm going to stop here. Do you have any questions for me? No, that was so helpful. This case has been bothering me for a little bit. So good. No, I like this case. This is a, this, yeah, this is, yeah, no, I like this case. Great case. All right. I am going to let you out of the hot seat and uh, just happened to glance that we are a few minutes over. So I'm going to just for a second here, see, do we have any questions? Now, if you have a question, there is a little question button that you can hit. Um, and if you will, I will get to you here. All right, not seeing any questions uh, right now. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up for tonight. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. We will have a structured case webinar tomorrow, Wednesday night, the 22nd. Please join us there and um, that'll be it for tonight. Thank you. <laughs>